Hello and welcome into the 24-7 Sports Football Recruiting Podcast. I'm National Recruiting Analyst Cooper Patek alongside 24-7 Sports Director of Scouting, Tom Loy, National College Football Reporter. And we got the quad box today. Shout out Scott Hansen, NFL Network. We're bringing in our friend, David Eichold, Hawkeyes Insider. And uh, boys, anything happening today in the world of college football? How about Caden Proctor, the number one offensive tackle, number two player in the transfer portal? Well, Long story here, so let me set the stage of what we're getting ready to get into. And in case you've been sleeping under a rock, it's been a roller coaster for Caden Proctor. Let's go back to his high school days where he was a product out of the state of Iowa. Commits to the Iowa Hawkeyes June 30th, 2022. Takes an official visit to Alabama December 16th. Decommits the day before signing day. Flips to the Crimson Tide. Starts all 14 games as a true freshman at the left tackle position. And then on January 17th, to the shock of many, enters the transfer portal after Nick Saban retires, commits to the Hawkeyes three days later, and now here we are. Iowa Hawkeyes, they start spring practice today, and on Tuesday this week, Caden Proctor makes his intentions known that he plans to enroll back in Tuscaloosa with the Alabama Crimson Tide. Don't underestimate a good spring break, David Eichold. Uh, David, you shot me a DM about 15 minutes before we went on the show. You said, hey, I got some good context on this. And I said, hey, you know what? We're, we're going to make a last-minute change and bring in our boy. But, David, like I said, I just kind of threw the timeline out there. It's been a roller coaster of events. Tell us what you know about this situation and how Caden Proctor arrived here. First of all, what a 1,000 IQ play by Caden Proctor to get a front-row seat to the Caitlin Clark show for a couple months and then go back to <laughs> Tuscaloosa, right? Uh, but, no, this has been a very, very interesting saga to follow because – you know, think back to even a month ago. This is something where, you know, Caden Proctor was in winter workouts. He was making friends with his teammates, reuniting with his old former buddy, Xavier Wampa, who's currently a starting safety at Iowa. And then, you know, he goes on spring break with his boys from Alabama. Good times are had, I'm sure. And they say, you know what? Why don't you come back to Alabama? And I think after thinking upon that, Caden Proctor got back to the University of Iowa and again, this is not something that has built up. This was an absolute sudden change to where what I was told yesterday morning was Cain Proctor did not go to the team workout. He did not attend the team meeting last night. He went to Kirk Ferentz's office and made it known that he was going to leave the University of Iowa's program. And then I got told from two separate sources that the Crimson Tide is where he's going. And then obviously Cain Proctor posted last night on his Instagram story, the Michael Jordan, I'm back. I would say leaving no doubt, but you guys know as well as I do. When that portal opens, everybody's going to be calling his phone unless he has a do not contact order. So crazy, crazy saga. And I'll tell you, this is not something the Iowa staff and obviously the team are very happy about considering a lot of his friends from the state of Iowa happen to play for the University of Iowa football team. And we're really pushing for the team to welcome him back after he spurned him on last signing day. So what's the what's response been from Iowa just in terms of Kirk Ferentz and what you've heard? Because I think a lot of people assume that, you know, Iowa's going to put their best foot forward over the next couple of weeks. Obviously, the portal window opens on April 15th. Uh, so they have a little bit of time to try to swoon Caden Proctor back. But, yeah, I mean, you have to think if you're Iowa, it, does that even make sense at this point? No, I, I think the bridges have, have been burnt. I don't think there's any more need to put any more resources with Cam Proctor. Iowa will return Connor Colby. They'll return Mason Richmond. They'll return Logan Jones. I mean, they have pieces. Now, granted, the offensive line struggled last season, but there is belief that they can take a step forward with, you know, Tim Lester, new offensive coordinator, changing up the scheme a little bit, being a little bit, you know, quote unquote, more unpredictable on offense, which would be a huge change in the Kirk Ferentz mantra but i do think that yes Cam proctor is incredibly talented he's got day one potential in the nfl draft but given all the context all the drama i think kirk ferentz just wants to be done with it maybe they explore the ncaa transfer portal for depth but th this one's absolutely done i do not see them reaching back out to Cam proctor to try to change his mind what's your what's your read on it just from your personal opinion because you know Caden proctor we mentioned he's a he's an iowa native right one of the most highly touted players that has come out of the state of iowa in quite some time, obviously had the recruitment, like I said, uh, was committed to Iowa, flipped on signing day. Your, your just overall feel on how everything has played out through your lens. It's been interesting, and I think it gets even more interesting when you introduce the NIL concept, because obviously the collective had a huge boost in, in subscriptions and donations when Proctor entered the portal. Iowa's Swarm Collective raised about $100,000 in two days. 
And right when Proctor decided to go back in the portal and go back to Alabama, there was a lot of fans, you know, in the Iowa fan base that said, you know what, why am I going to donate to this again? If, if he can take my money and not even suit up a snap. But from what I've been told from the Iowa's collective is they, he did not get one dime from the people's actual donations. He got a little bit of a cut from a couple of corporate sponsorships when, you know, we shot a commercial or he quote unquote did some work for them. So that's a little bit of misinformation that's out there. But there was about a 24 hour span yesterday where Iowa fans were incredibly upset thinking that, you know, Kane Proctor could have walked away with a hundred, hundred fifty thousand dollars after just watching Caitlin Clark on the sidelines for two months. Right. And maybe going to a couple of winter workouts and classes. So, you know, I think it's been dramatic. I think it's finally good that this chapter has come to an end. I think Kirk Ferentz more than anybody is happy to put this behind him because longest tenured head coach with all the changes in college football, this is not your father's college football. This isn't even my college football. For <laughs> you know, I grew up on right all the sudden changes. So it's going to be very interesting to hear Kirk Ferentz's response when we're, we ask him next Tuesday during the opening spring practice and the opening press conference, but just a giant cluster. Maybe it made too much sense for him to come back to Iowa, but uh, this is definitely going to be a wild spring portal period. If this is going to become the new norm. Do you? Well, yeah, go ahead, Drew. Well, Dave, I, I was going to bring this up. Like, this doesn't feel like something Iowa would ever be involved with. Like if you follow them on the recruiting trail, you know, the type of prospects and the recruitments they get involved with. Like this, yeah. this, <laughs> this, this, this is in Iowa, right? Like they're not even really involved in the transfer portal. I mean, how much did they invest? Not from like a monetary standpoint, but time wise indicate in Proctor. I, there's a great tweet that's out there from some fan. It's like, Caden Proctor at Iowa, two commitments, two decommitments, zero practices, zero <laughs> games, one NCAA violation. Like, I, I remember talking to him at some point, and he said this was before his senior year. He had stopped doing the photo shoots on visits because he had been to Iowa so many times. Like, it, you know, how long of a chat book is this thing? Yeah, I think that's the craziest part about it. And you're exactly right. I mean, even when Caden Proctor, you know, the rumors that he was going to enter the portal to go back to Iowa in the first place, I was a little bit surprised that Kirk Ferentz and them reached out. Now, if you have a five-star prospect, the number one prospect in the state of Iowa history, that probably had a little bit of something to do with it. Those uh, six foot eight, 360 pounders don't exactly uh, <laughs> grow on trees, right? So I think his talent had something to do with it. I believe they offered Caden Proctor when he was 14 to 15 years old. This has been a long-standing relationship. Obviously, we know about the self-reported, I believe, level three violation about the text message that was sent to him. I think it was after his second career start that said, essentially, keep your head up. But right when Kane Proctor entered the portal, I mean, it was a no doubt that he was going to come to the University of Iowa. But again, Iowa had to lay out an NIL plan for him because he's that type of talent. Kane Proctor won number 74, a highly touted Trevor Lauk who's probably going to play a big part in Iowa's offense line over the next couple of years, switch numbers for him. Kane Proctor has been on Iowa's official roster. I think he was on there for about 12 hours before he decided that he wasn't going to come back for spring practice. So as far as resources, I think there was a lot more resources in play when it came to the actual recruiting process. But again, you're exactly right. Usually when a guy decommits from Iowa, Kirk Ferentz, them say, you know what, that's fine. But we're going to wipe our hands clean. We, we just, we don't want to deal with it. We're going to go on to the next prospect. We want guys that want us, but given Proctor's stature, given his accolades, given his upside and his talent, there's no doubt that this is going to sting a little bit more, but as far as the resources goes, I, I'm very intrigued right now because they still have to get rid of a couple scholarships or convert some guys to walk-ons uh, if they want to explore the transfer portal. And there's no doubt that there's going to be a giant hole at left tackle and a lot of questions now that, Tim Wester has to answer that he did not think he was going to have to answer just a couple of days ago. It's an impossible situation. I don't think people really understand that. Now, you know, Iowa thinks that they have a all-conference potential All-American, uh, one of the best tackles in terms of uh, in terms of the progression of the position with Caden Proctor. Now they have to go back to the drawing board and what could be a limited market, not to mention a completely oversaturated market, right? If, mm -hmm. if a priority tackle hits the portal, it's going to be a very competitive market. Uh, David, you and I were talking before we jumped on. Kirk Ferentz is 68. And, you know, you think about Nick Saban, and I think a lot has been said about some of the reasons why he decided to retire when he retired. 
you know, I'm not trying to speculate on that. You think that, you know, he's got a couple of good years left ahead of him. An event like this, it, it can kind of rock the boat a little bit. I mean, what do you think he's thinking right now in the midst of dealing with this Caden Proctor situation? And it, and it hasn't been all sunshine and rainbows over the last couple of years either. I was going to say a lot of words that I probably can't repeat on the airwaves. That's probably exactly what he's thinking right now. But I do think going back to the core of Kirk Ferentz and what he always tells, at least the media and behind closed doors, is the fact that he loves coaching football. He likes the actual football aspect. And I know that's been a big reason why he's still coaching today. I mean, his spring football period, the fall camp period, he says are his favorite times of the year because you don't have to game plan. You don't have to go out scouting. You get to focus on the guys that are in the locker room and personal development. And that's what really keeps him going day by day. So I think this is something that's going to sting, but I'm very intrigued about if this spring process and going through spring practice, I don't want to say reignites the fire, but just keep pours a little bit more gasoline to keep it burning a little bit brighter. But I'm kind of with you at this point. I'm kind of year by year speculating until Kirk Ferentz decides to hang it up. I think this year is going to be a very interesting year from this standpoint. Iowa returns nine of their 11 star defensive stars are, I would argue, the best defense in college football, at least top three. Sebastian Castro, Jay Higgins, Nick Jackson, who is probably as old as I am, and Jordan Bohannon at this point, uh, continuing to play in his sixth year of college football. Iowa's got a good special teams. Their offense is going through kind of a giant turnover. But there's a lot of optimism. So, again, it's going to be a year-by-year speculating thing from me. I've been told he wants four to five years left, maybe coach the remainder of his contract. Iowa's absolutely going to let him if he wants to. But I'll tell you, the timeline is going to get very interesting here, especially after this season. I believe he's going to stay, but I know there are a lot of outsiders, and there's a lot of people on the recruiting trail that have asked Kirk if he's going to continue to stick around. So it's going to be something I'm going to watch for. I'm not going to try to overreact yet. We'll kind of see as the season unfolds if he still has it. I wouldn't blame him one bit. You know, it kind of reminds me of Chris Peterson at Washington. I think everybody has yeah. it in mind. And, and you know, these guys feel like they can coach three to four years. It's not so much coaching. I think they feel that they can do that at a very high level for a very long time. It's everything else that comes with a job that makes you lose sleep at night. David Eichel, we appreciate you joining us, especially on such a short timeline. Guys, you can follow David Eichel at David Eichel. On X, also one of the best in the business, doing it for us at the Hawkeyes Insider at 24-7 Sports. David, we appreciate you, man. Hey, thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Well, what a loaded storyline, boys, and what a way to jump into it. Uh, Drew, I, you've had a morning. You were on cover three. We'll get your video back up here in a second. You're on cover three with Bud Elliott, Danny Cannell, uh, Chip Brown, and the boys uh, over there, Tom Fornelli as well. And, um you know, Caden Proctor certainly uh, the headline today in, in the college football news cycle. But um, Drew, I'm gonna I'm gonna tee it up for you. Obviously, we talked about the timeline. David gave some really good context on how Caden Proctor has now arrived at the the decision to transfer back to Alabama. Just your 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 thoughts on this in general. You can take it whatever way you want to go. So I think this is the one where. Uh, the, the casual fans going to be like, all right, what, what, what exactly are we doing here? Um, and, and for me, like, I want to be clear, I'm all for player movement, right. NIL, all that stuff. I get it. Yes. I'm, I'm not against that. I just think this is a sign that we need some guardrails in place when it comes to player movement. Um, because look at Iowa, you know, I didn't realize they had such a big void at left tackle, but out of all the programs in college football, right? So 130, you know, there's probably five programs equipped to lose their left tackle the week before the start of, of spring practices and it not, you know, be decimating to the upcoming season. Um, you know, I, I keep saying it on this podcast and you do as well, Cooper, like we are getting closer and closer to an NFL model. Like let's, let's just call it what it is. High school recruiting is your NFL draft. Uh, the transfer portal is free agency. So let's think about an NFL team, right? They go out and they sign a, an elite offensive tackle. And then the day before training camp, he's like, yeah, I'm good, man. You know, I'm, I'm going to go somewhere else. And then Iowa doesn't get anything from this. There's no compensatory pick. I, I think that's what people need to understand here. Like this is crippling for Iowa in the sense of, you know, did players transfer out because Caden Proctor came in? Apparently they made some kid changes number because Caden Proctor showed up. I mean, 
to me, like, hopefully this is a sign to whoever is making the decisions that, all right, we need to get some structure. We need to get some, some guardrails in place because I think it's only going to lead. I, I think there's only gonna be more of this and it, it's going to lead to burnout with, with college coaches. Like if you are an Iowa coach right now, are you waking up this morning and being like, what am I doing here? You know, how are we supposed to build a roster if 365 days of the year, someone can just pull this guy off my roster. So that's it. And then the final thing I got is like, if I was donating to the Iowa collective, I would also wake up this morning and be like, what am I doing? And I know David outlined that, you know, Caden didn't get any money, but I still think you're having that conversation on the inside. He might not have gotten any money. I think what was important about what David said, I think within 48 hours of hitting the portal, that Iowa collective raised over $100,000, right? Um, which I think was a strong indication of where that money and those resources were being pulled. Um, Drew, I think everything you talked about, like you keep talking about college heading towards the NFL model, I think th those are contractual obligations, right? As of right now, there's nothing to tie Caden Proctor to Iowa uh, to prevent him from leaving to go to Tuscaloosa. And I think that's probably more of the, the frustrating thing. And, you know, I'm trying not to aim my frustration so much at Caden Proctor because he, he could be the first, but he's certainly not going to be the last of this case uh, with anything. Drew, I think we've kind of picked up on some scuttlebutt that there might be more of this in the near future with some names that might rock the boat more so than a guy like Caden Proctor. So uh, we'll see what happens there. I think it's a broken system. And I think the thing that's the most concerning, what you said, Andrew, is, well, those in charge need to fix it. Who's in charge? I don't, I don't know. I'm just who, saying who someone's got to fix who it. Who can enforce these rules? No, I'm with you 110%. But, you know, when I, I asked Bud Elliott this morning, we were on a call before he had to jump on his podcast, and I said, well, who's in charge of fixing it? Is it Congress? Is it legislation? Is it the NCAA? Is it Charlie Baker? You know, is, is it the SEC? Is it the Big Ten? Who's really going to be able to make these changes and, and impact changes? Because it seems like every time the governing body wants to get involved, they just get hit with an injunction and a countersuit, right? That seems to be like the popular thing to do. And I don't want to get too in the weeds because that's certainly not my forte. Um, but it is frustrating from a roster construction standpoint, like you said, where you feel like you have a top 10 player at the position in the country. And that's what you're going forward with in terms of, hey, we're going forward in the spring. We're starting spring practice tomorrow. And this is what I know I have versus the next day, poof, he's not there anymore. Right. And now we got to scramble and now we got to figure that out. And we got a portal that, that opens in three and a half weeks and it's going to be a limited market. Um, so that's extremely frustrating. The other thing, I talked to somebody close with this situation and the, the, I'm paraphrasing, but the quote here was sometimes I wonder why I do what I do. I felt that way three years ago when I was a director of player personnel. Now you add in NIL, the transfer portal, uh, the level of ambiguity in, rapid change and you you can't predict what comes tomorrow that is a very difficult thing to do to build a winning product and a sustainable product year over year so you know we keep talking about these things burnout coaches maybe looking towards the nfl these are the things that come into play when you have no idea what your position room is going to look like those are the things that make you wonder why am i doing what i'm what i'm doing and drew you said it iowa got left with what a level three violation, they probably lose some cachet in the locker room, looking like fools, giving Caden Proctor everything that he wanted. It's a hard thing to come back from. And now, you, you know, you got Kirk Ferentz, 68 years old. He's probably thinking to myself, what am I doing? What am I doing? And it's a very legitimate question. So, Tom, I feel bad. <laughs> 20 minutes in the show, you have not said a word. You're looking good over there. Um <laughs> <laughs> I thought his microphone wasn't working. Yeah, did we, did we cut you off? What, what's going on? Do you have an opinion on this? Yeah, I just I was just blown away by I mean by the situation. I'm sitting there at dinner last night with some friends, and I get a text. This is happening, and um, was just kind of like, what are we doing? And 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 what what's happening in college football? But um, then I see the reaction from the fan base, and I see a lot of a lot of Iowa fans kind of acting like like how I would be acting. They're just kind of over it. You know, this kid didn't pick them from the start. And then transfers there, picks them. Some people think it's NIL related and great. And obviously Nick Saban leaving played the biggest factor. Now all of a sudden they're going back. And instead of people having a meltdown 
from the fan base. I think they're just frustrated with the whole process. They're frustrated with um, Proctor. They're not really taking it out on Iowa or their lack of being able to keep this kid, get it done, which I kind of appreciated because I think this was completely out of Iowa's hands. Um, then I read I Cold Story and it's it's going in depth about this this spring break trip that they're taking and Cade McNamara and all the offensive linemen are together, except for Caden Proctor, who's with Al his former teammates at Alabama. Um, so I'm seeing all that unfold, which is amazing. It's tremendous reporting from, from David. Um, and then I'm seeing additional stuff on other, you know, other message boards on 24 seven sports and Twitter and things like that of people speculating, okay, well, Caleb Downs is next. Julian saying, is he going to stick all this kind of stuff? And it's just crazy. The, the reaction to one person and how this is, you know, obviously, you know, Ivan's, you touched on this, like, hopefully this isn't going to be the future. And, and I, I too am all for player movement and finding the best fit for you and your future. But man, this, this poor Iowa, um, definitely feel bad for them this late in the spring football. And, um, uh, it's just wild, the reaction and the speculation that comes from this, but it's going to be a crazy spring. And obviously it's not going to slow down anytime soon. You can say poor Iowa and I, I get what you're saying. I'm yeah. not poking holes in that, but what, what's preventing this from happening to well, whoever your favorite school is? Well, that's the thing. Like, that's what I was trying to get at. Like Iowa would is, is never in this situation and how are they in it? You know, like they're kind of in a lose, lose. Um, we don't have to spend all day talking Kate Proctor. Two things. Do we have a location for that spring break trip? Do we know where Caden Proctor was? On Not yet. Break? Must have been wild, though. <laughs> I, I was I was assuming somewhere in Florida. Um, second thing, I think a lot of people are like, okay, well, they can replace them via the transfer portal. And I heard a fascinating stat yesterday. If you look at the top 20 offensive tackles in the NFL, okay, the top 20 graded out guys, all of them were either drafted or traded for. None of them are free agent signees. And again, I keep saying we're going to an NFL model. We keep saying that market is so limited for those offensive tackles. And I went out, I look back at the 2023 transfer rake rankings for 24-7 sports, those top offensive tackles. Yeah, like the top four all ended up playing over 700 snaps and hitting. But after that, it's a bunch of did not play and got limited snaps at guard. These bodies aren't out there. So, you know, I, I just want to point that out on this position. You know, you can't just go and sign some free agent. That's going to fill the hole. Last thing I will say, we've talked a lot about Iowa. This is huge for Alabama. I mean, this guy started 14 games for him last year. The other thing about that is you look at Alabama's now uh, offensive line now, left to right. You got Tyler Booker, one of the best interior offensive linemen in the country. Parker Brailsford comes over from Washington, certainly uh, one of the most highly touted uh, freshmen in the country last year at the center position. Jaden Roberts at right guard, and now Elijah Pritchard, who was a five-star for us, been sitting on the bench for the last two years, primed and ready to go at right tackle. I mean, so I don't know what you want to call it. Give credit to Alabama. Give credit to Alabama's players, I guess, uh, for <laughs> getting Caden Proctor back in the boat, but it, it, it fills a huge need for them. And then, like David expressed earlier, huge blow for Iowa. Um, and I think for Kirk Ferentz, it's not an identity crisis, but it's a huge fork in the road about how you want to proceed going forward because this is certainly a uh, sticking point, I think, in college football, but Iowa uh, certainly as well. Guys, we appreciate you uh, tuning in to the 24-7 Sports Football Recruiting Podcast. You can find us every Tuesday and Wednesday at 11 o'clock Central Time, noon Eastern as well. We will be on X. If you're watching us on X, guys, we appreciate you. You can get active in the chat. That is the place to do it. Also, if you have questions, make sure to head over to the 24-7 Sports YouTube channel to like and subscribe. That helps us a lot, the Oyster Boys over here. All three of us, we are forever grateful. Boys, the uh, college football recruiting world, it keeps charging on right regardless of what's happening with with Caden Proctor and the rest of the world but we got some uh, commitments coming up and a handful of them that uh, are ones to watch and let's start at the top how about Daryl Johnson from Dodge County in Georgia the number five linebacker in the country number 48 player overall well guess what 5 30 today eastern time 24 7 sports YouTube channel Daryl Johnson is going to be making his commitment Tom, you got a, you got all the goods, man, especially the intel. What's your pulse on uh, Daryl Johnson on decision day? Yeah, you're kind of watching Alabama, Florida State, Florida, Tennessee, UCF, a couple others, but I think uh, Alabama could be in line for some more good news here. I feel really good about my crystal ball pick. 
Um, I know Brett Greenberg and the boys over there at uh, our Alabama site at 24-7 Sports have been all over this one. Um, they have considered Alabama the favorite for a long time. I think since uh, definitely over the last month or so. Um, Kane Womack doing an excellent job there. Just feel really good about the Crimson Tide. I do, do not see them losing out on uh, one of the best linebackers in the country. Tom, um, correct me if I'm wrong here. Alabama, like two months ago, really wasn't involved in this recruitment all that yeah. much. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of kind of wild how quickly things have swung in their favor. Um, one visit and it seemed to be a game changer, and they've had nothing but optimism. So at this point, it would be a, a big shock if, if they missed on here. So yeah, it's a, they're doing a phenomenal job. And, and Coop, I, I, yeah, I think ahead. that's I'm taking over your role here. <laughs> I think that's notable because a month ago we all sat up here. And we're like, all right, what's Alabama going to look like? And, I mean, I remember Daryl Johnson at the Under Armour Atlanta camp over here in his interviews. I didn't hear Alabama at all. So you think about Kalen DeBoer, you know, what's it going to look like with him there in Tuscaloosa coming over from Washington? I think if you're an Alabama fan, this is a good sign. And I think if you're a fan of other schools, it's like, oh, okay, like Kalen DeBoer can recruit a little bit. That's kind of my, my read here. I think they've been under a microscope. You know, and it's the same way I kind of related to Brian Kelly two years ago. I think the biggest question was, can Brian Kelly recruit the state of Louisiana and can he recruit the footprint of the Southeastern Conference? And I think with Kalen DeBoer, it's a very, uh, I would say, fair question. If you were going to ask, can that staff recruit at a high level, uh, seeing what they did at the University of Washington? And like if I had to give them a grade for what they did at UW, I give them like a C plus. You know, and, I, and I'm not talking about on the field. I think they're one of the best coaching staffs in the country. I think Kalen DeBoer has proved that. Now, in terms of talent acquisition, they did a really good job with the transfers that they brought in. They hit on Penix. They hit on Dylan Johnson. They hit on Jalen Polk. They hit on uh, Jabbar Muhammad. Like, they did a good job uh, in terms of what they had to supplement that roster with. That being said, they have come out swinging at Alabama, and I think that's to be expected. People might uh, balk at this a little bit, but I think the biggest thing is, what is this going to look like in like a three-year sample size? Can you continue to put your foot on the gas pedal and apply pressure over that span? And what I mean, can you do this year in and year out? Because ultimately, that's what you get judged by. It's about stockpiling talent. It's an arms race in the SEC. They're off to a very good start. And if they got Daryl Johnson, I think that would be another good start. The thing about Daryl Johnson that's pretty interesting, correct me if I'm wrong, boys, I don't believe he's got a UGA offer. Uh, guy, I don't have it in front of me, but I don't, from, I don't from, think that's, from yeah, the state of Georgia, right? So you're thinking about a position that, quite honestly, I don't think there's a better program in the country in developing second-level talent than the University of Georgia. I don't find it curious. I just find it something to point out in Daryl Johnson. You're talking about a top-50 player in the country. Drew, you and I have talked about this. I think a lot of people – have had trouble placing Daryl Johnson. What's he going to be, right? A guy that can play on ball, can play off ball. He's played a little bit of corner. He's played a little bit of safety. He's 6'1", I believe, uh, hovering around there, almost 200 pounds. Runs well. I think he's a little bit raw. I do think there's some question marks in, in, in his game. That being said, I have no issue with this take if Alabama does end up being the spot for Daryl Johnson, and I like him a lot. And I think you and I had this conversation how would we be reacting to some of these takes for Kalen DeBoer if it wasn't Kalen DeBoer and it was Nick Saban? And I would be equally as excited um, for Nick Saban if they were to land Daryl Johnson, right? Um, so, well, anyway, third, just a third, third thought on that. Third, third commit in a row, potentially. That is a three-phase playmaker. Uh, and you're right. I think Alabama's 13 right now in the rankings. They add Duke Johnson. Maybe that moves them into the top 10. Like this is where Alabama normally would be in the process. And about Georgia and Duke Johnson, they kind of swim in a different pool than everyone else, right? You mentioned that term raw with, with Daryl Johnson. What is he? I mean, we're betting on the athlete. That's why we have him ranked where he does. At Georgia, you know what they took at linebacker the past two years is, you know, there isn't a lot of time to learn or they're going to push you out and bring someone else in. So I think you got to bring that up. They don't want developmental players at Georgia. They want guys that can step in and play immediately. Not everybody can recruit like that, but when you won back-to-back -back national championships, you were in it for a third. Uh, they have a different pedigree, especially with Nick Saban uh, kind of out of the equation a little bit. Obviously, I mean, think about what George has brought in, 
right? I mean, we're talking about C.J. Allen, Raylan Wilson, Troy Bowles, another guy this last year, Justin Williams, Christopher Jones, uh, and, and I'm Chris missing Cole. Chris Cole, one of my favorites, right? Um, so how many guys did I just name? Six, seven, six. right? Uh, five of those, four, four out of the six of those guys are some of the best athletes at the position over the last two years, pound for pound. Right. And they're all going to the same place. So it is interesting to kind of see that. But um, Tom, another I will say real quick, one yeah. thing that I was kind of just scraping his Twitter account because I wanted to see if like we were missing something or maybe he reported an offer and it, you know, just, you know, it was a while back. But all of his tweets early on in his process were, were uh, very much pro Georgia. So it's clearly that and he took a bunch of trips to, to Athens. So it makes you wonder if they do decide to go all in at some point, make him a priority later in the process you know, and he commits now to Alabama, will that love for Georgia and infatuation is the way it comes across for Georgia play a factor. But I know, obviously, I think they, they know what they what they would be passing on at this point by now. So a, a guy in state with his caliber of ability, you know, they've done their homework, right? That's all I'll say. So we'll, we'll see what happens with Daryl yeah. Johnson, another guy that Alabama seems to be in a good spot, uh, in on with what in with whatever Luke Metz number 59 linebacker in the country another guy from the state of Georgia uh, out of Mill Creek High School he's got a commitment coming up relatively soon Tom what can you tell us about that one commitment is coming sat Sunday um, and he's got two trips left he's got to be at Alabama on Thursday and he's going to be at uh, Ole Miss on Saturday and he's going to commit 24 hours later so he's going to go home from the trip uh, to Ole Miss sit down with his family make a decision I think he's kind of leaning a, a you know, specific particular direction right now, heading into the final two trips. Um, and, and this kid's been infatuated with SEC football since day one, um, you know, tough for Duke because they were the early team to beat. They were in a great spot, um, a really good spot. I'll just leave it at that. Um, expected him to, to land there until he started blowing up and he, he got some big offers and he got uh, Bama and LSU and Ole Miss and a few others. So, um, but his love for SEC football, he's very high on himself as a player and he believes he can play at that level and, and play at the next level beyond that. So um, I was really thinking LSU was going to be the team to beat, but Alabama, Ole Miss have out recruited them. These are probably your two finalists at this point, in my opinion. And um, my gut says Alabama heading into these last two trips, but Ole Miss, obviously we should not write them off, especially 24 hours before his decision. But in talking to people on both sides, the, the buzz is definitely around the Crimson Tide heading into Sunday's uh, decision. Drew, he's in your area. What do you, what do you think about this kid? <laughs> I was going to ask you because I've watched him a bunch. I mean, three down linebacker, right? I think he flows well to the football, you know, disengages from blocks. I think he offers some value as a pass rusher, you know, someone where there's not a ton of verified information on in terms of the measurements, you know, the numbers I got show might not have the longest of arms. Okay. What does that mean? Well, I just said he can get home on the blitz. You know, he's going to be playing in the sec, you know, can you disengage from those tackles, those guards that are chipping you? But I like who, I mean, when I initially watched him, what I wrote down is like need more information as soon as possible. So uh, I think he's a guy that can play in the sec. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think, you know, from a height, weight, speed standpoint, that's what we need to figure out. Just more athletic speed context. In terms of the tape, I like the tape. I mean, you think about a backer, a key and diagnose. A guy's got a really good feel for space, uh, plays sideline to sideline. He's like a more traditional 3-4 inside linebacker, like a guy that would have thrived maybe like 10 years ago, um, but has enough athletic ability to play in this day and age. I like him. I think he's at the right place, right time. Uh, is he going to be a guy that's going to climb our board because of his physical ability? I don't think so. But is he going to be a high floor, high cognitive guy that you can plug and play uh, after a year and, and give you some quality depth? Absolutely. Um, and I think he can play in the SEC, no problem. I think the other thing, too, is that Mill Creek defense. You know, uh, Caleb Downs a couple of years or two cycles ago, you know, they had some, some dudes last year like – not a bad idea to to get Josh Lovelady in that program there at Mill Creek. Like they they play a good brand of football. Somebody uh, when somebody shout out to our boy Brett Greenberg. He was asking me say, hey Coop, if, you know if they can land Daryl Johnson, if they can land Luke Metz, like what does that make you think about the state of Georgia uh, and Alabama recruiting it? Is that something that we need to keep an eye on going forward? Drew, my my answer to that is not really. 
you know, Georgia is one of the most robust states when it comes to putting out talent year after year, especially in the top 247. The NFL draft kind of reflects that as well. It's a borderless game. Uh, I used to kind of balk at it a little bit when Clemson was going down there and, and being able to to grab a handful of players. Tay Harris, another guy out of Cedartown uh, that we talked about yesterday on the, on the show. I don't know. I just feel like the Southeastern Conference is better to kind of label as one bucket, right? It's not like, hey, you went into Georgia or you went into Alabama or you went into Mississippi. It's not like that anymore. Maybe the only place like that is Louisiana. That's a tough place to go into and kind of pluck guys out. But outside okay. of that, I kind of feel like it's a free-for-all. Can I push back a little bit on that? Well, I do agree it's a free-for-all, kind of borderless. Just label it the South. That's your recruiting bucket if you're in the SEC, you know, Florida, Georgia, Alabama, and all that stuff. But – I think it is notable that Alabama could be in line to pick up two commitments from Georgia or in the state of Georgia because Kayla DeBoer and that staff are coming from Washington. I know guys came from different places, but they could have easily went to the well and, and focused on the guys they were recruiting when they were with the Huskies. You know, mm -hmm. there was not much overlap in the targets. So I think that's another promising sign about Alabama and what they're going to be able to do on the recruiting trail. The fact that it wasn't like Brian Kelly when he took over at LSU that first year. Think about how national uh, of uh, that class was. I mean, it was kids from all different corners of the country. They self-corrected real fast. Um, so I, I do think that's notable with Alabama. There's a pretty good quarterback they're recruiting in Georgia as well this cycle. That would be icing on the cake if they could uh, get that done with Julian Lewis. So. We'll see what happens with Julian Lewis. That one uh, should be eventful. Uh, currently committed to the USC Trojans. Uh, Tom, the last one on the list here, Marshall Pritchett, number 30 tied in in the country. He's got a commitment coming up on Sunday. I believe it's a uh, Battle of the Carolinas at this point. Is that right? That's the way I see it. He's at, he's committing on Saturday, um, and uh, that's that's where I see this one trending. North Carolina, South Carolina. I believe he told me earlier this week he's actually going to be at Michigan for a last-second visit uh, later actually today, so he's there now. Um, but I really just I struggle to see the Wolverines getting that done. Um, I do believe he's already made a commitment privately to the school of his choice. Um, I just think the, the majority of the buzz as of late has been around North Carolina. I feel like the Tar Heels, Chip Lindsey uh, and those guys on the offensive side of the ball are doing a great job. Getting, and I think they're going to get it done there. Um, I think that's that's one that South Carolina really wants to win. So they're going to dig in until the end. But he's an actually a Notre Dame legacy. His dad played on a championship team at um, back in 88, I believe it was, and uh, really good player, quarterback turned tight end, um, very athletic, a lot to like there, but I think North Carolina gets it done. Buckle up, boys. It could be a long show. Uh, I think our record together is, what, hour 20, which we set last week. Uh, Caden Proctor took up 20 minutes, took us 20 minutes to get through uh, previewing the upcoming commitments, and guess what? We still got the Blue Blood heat check. And we got viewer questions, which is always our favorite as well. Guys, like I said, if you're following on the 24-7 Sports YouTube channel, make sure to like and subscribe. You can also ask a question in the chat. If you're on X, you want to mix it up with the boys, especially Tom Loy. Listen, if you're trying to figure out how your favorite team's doing, where the crystal ball is leaning, what's what, who's who, Tom Loy, we got him here in the building. Make sure to fire in those questions. All right, boys, let's pick up the pace a little bit, right, as we go into our two-minute drill. Blue blood heat check, top targets for traditional powers. Most of these schools are outside of the top 10, and by most, I mean all of them. Uh, right now, Nebraska, the Cornhuskers, Matt Rule, they're sitting at number 45. Their past three finishes have been 18, 25, and 41. A couple of the names on the board, and boys, I'll just chalk it up, put it out there, and you guys can go with it wherever you want. TJ Latif talked about him yesterday on the show, the quarterback from Origin Lutheran out there in California. Christian Jones, a top 247 prospect right there in state. Uh, Jack Lang, is that correct, Tom? Did I get the pronunciation right? Yeah, yeah. Off yeah. Offensive tackle. Tell you what, turned on his tape this morning, like him a lot. Got Cortez Mills out of the state of Florida. Huge fan of him. And then Keelan Abrams out of DeSoto in Texas. Um, I'll tell you what, I know it's a wish list. Uh, Drew, Tom, either of you can take it, but I mean, shoot. If Nebraska finished with three or four of these guys, I'd be really impressed. Well, I, we, we discussed TJ Latif earlier in the week. You know, I think he'd be great to follow up behind Dylan Riola. To me, the one that really jumps out, Cortez Mills, right? Nebraska sitting 45th right now in the recruiting rankings. All three of those kids are in-state prospects that are committed. 
We know they want to get down into Florida. Matt Rule did that when he was at Temple. He did that when he was at Baylor, and he scored big. I mean, Tyquan Thornton at Baylor was a kid he pulled out of Miami-Dade. So Cortez Mills, to me, that's the one where I'm like, okay, let's see if they can get him up to Lincoln. And I think about the quarterbacks they have or, or the quarterbacks they could have, Riola, TJ Latif. Uh, Cortez Mills, dynamic route runner. I, I think that's where he really excels at creating separation. I get fired up about that potential marriage between those two. And I, I think they need this type of wide receiver. This is what Nebraska needs. So for me, that's the one that kind of jumps out. So my crystal ball for Cortez Mills is on Miami. But like I said, when I first put it in, the, the one school I'm watching is Nebraska. He seems to like them a great deal. He's got a great relationship with the coaching staff and they are one to watch um, if they're going to dip into if somebody's going to dip into the Sunshine State and get that one done, steal him from Miami. It could be Nebraska. I still like Nebraska for TJ Latif. Been kind of close to crystal balling them for a long time. I just haven't pulled the trigger. I probably should. I think they are far and away the leader right now. They are recruiting him harder than ever. He's going to be there for an official visit in April. But there's there's still a weird storyline when it comes to Texas that I'm watching. And we talked about this before. It's just something uncertain when it when it comes to Texas and their quarterback commit KJ Lacey, um, and maybe Alabama and eventually gets involved there. But you know, I'm hearing that they've reached out and had some communication with TJ Latif. They've reached out and had some communication with Keelan Russell, the SMU commit. So maybe they're just covering their their tracks and making sure that they don't get left at the altar. But that's just something that like if they lose if if Texas loses KJ Lacey, I think Texas has especially with the relationship between Steve Sarkeesian and TJ Latif and the respect that he has for the Longhorns head coach, they could dip in and, and pull off the, you know, the upset as it is now uh, and beat Nebraska for Latif. So that's, that's one I'm watching. A um, couple other guys just to throw out. I know you mentioned Christian Jones. I think that's kind of a Nebraska Notre Dame battle. He's going to be in South Bend uh, for their spring game in April. And then for an official visit in June, on June 7th, had some, had a teammate land there, uh, last cycle. And I just feel like that that's a dark horse there, but I think the smart money, safe money is on Nebraska. And then Jack Lang, another Notre Dame, Nebraska, I mean, yeah, Notre Dame, Nebraska battle. Um, I kind of lean towards Notre Dame, but there's some things behind the scenes, um, including multiple visits to Nebraska that are already lined up. So keeping on Nebraska there, I think they could pull off what I think many would consider an upset over Notre Dame and Jack Lang, like you said, Cooper, big time talent, but he's the real deal. So <laughs> Tom, well, um, I'm glad glad Coop likes Jack Lang. He's in the All American Bowl, committed to play in the All American Bowl. Appreciate that. We haven't had we haven't had uh, positional cross checks yet, so you know a lot of these guys. Sometimes I'm like, it's a surprise, Drew. You've been there, right? It's like yeah, first time you're seeing course. a guy, and then you go check the rank, and you're like, oh, nice, a pleasant surprise. I'm glad we got him where we're you know where we're supposed to have him. Um, Tom, any feel that Nebraska is like you know I don't want to say amping it up, but do you, do you feel from an NIL standpoint they're they're starting to kind of get it together a little bit. I think I think Dylan Riola kind of checked that box pretty clearly in my opinion. And I just think they're trending for sure in the right direction. And um, but I don't know if that's necessarily going to be what lands them some of these guys. I mean you talked about if they can land three of these guys. I don't think NIL would be the difference maker. Cortez Mills because they're 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 gonna have to yeah they're gonna have to be involved in that game would be I mean, yeah going up against Miami but at the same time I just I, I don't know I think that for that kid especially relationships playing time connection with the coaching staff and you know quarterback play I think that's gonna play a bigger deal than just cash and money and and you know value I just I don't know I just see it a little differently where I think that I feel good about my Miami pick no question about it but I think Nebraska more than just money um is doing a great job there and they have a, they have a real shot relationships matter in March. Come talk to me in December and then we'll see where we're at. You know, Cortez Mills, I got a, I got a text uh, this week from a director or player personnel in the sec completely unprompted just says, I love Cortez Mills. And I was like, Hey, we were talking about him the other day on the show. That guy can roll. Uh, the crystal ball is on Miami right now. We're big fans uh, of him. We talked about Jack Lang, certainly a guy that we like. I think Christian Jones is like the epitome of what you would expect of a Nebraska Cornhusker. So Nebraska team to watch right now. I believe only three commitments, uh, number 45 right now per the 24-7 sports composite team rankings. Another program, Drew, that I would say, Safe to say, has an up arrow when it comes to high school recruiting. Let's talk about Florida State, Mike Norvell, and the Knowles. They're already in the top 20 in 2025, number 19. Their past three finishes, 12th, 
2024, 19 in 2023, 20th in 2022. So everything I just said reflected there in their rankings and what they've done in the last three years. A couple names that stand out that Florida State would be hoping to finish with. Myron Charles, Zaire Addison, Kevin Wynn out of the state of Georgia, Gregory Xavier Thomas, and one of my favorite, Tavian Wallace Drew. Is there one name in that group, which is a super talented group, is there one or two names in that group that you're like, okay, I really like that fit in Tallahassee? Oh, I'm going to give you three, right? So Zaire Addison, think about pairing him with uh, Solomon Thomas on the offensive line, who they already have committed. Addison, I think he can play anywhere up front. And, uh, you know, he was very impressive in Orlando at the Under Armour All-American game. You know, a ton of schools involved. Easy to see why, but Mike Norvell, Alex Atkins, they continue to prioritize these offense alignments. So he's one. And then the two, the two big, you know, heavy Chevys up front, Myron Charles, Kevin Wynn. I, I think it's a limited pool, not only in the South, but nationally for interior IDLs. Myron Charles, I think the tape doesn't match the traits just yet, but Florida State's in there. He is someone with some developmental upside. So him and then Kevin Wynn. I don't know if we've ever talked about him in this space. I mean, he is, he's just a pocket mover up front, you know, can hold up traffic, flush them out, uh, out of the state of Georgia, FSU, the, you know, the, our guys that cover it were asking me for some information on him, you know, kind of before we came out with our most recent top two, four, seven update. I'm like, Oh, okay. So like Florida state's all in on Kevin Wynn. Uh, so those are the ones for me, Coop. Tom, what's your uh, what's your feel on Florida State right now? Temperature check. I mean, just in terms of being around it, uh, it's been a couple months now since you've been assigned to your new position. What what are you feeling with uh, with the Knowles? I like what they're doing. I mean, if we're talking about Big Three and in state, I'm not necessarily. I wouldn't give them the number one nod compared to Miami and Florida right now, but I really like what Florida State's doing. Um, and I like them, what they're doing with this group. I think that they have a great shot to land Myron Charles, top two, four, seven defensive lineman. Um, I think that they are very much in it for Zaire Addison. He's going to official visit Florida State, Clemson, and Oregon. I think USC's a sleeper, came on a little late. He's been there a couple times, um, so don't rule out the Trojans. And then Kevin Wynn, I, like you said, Ivans, I could see Florida State getting this one done. I think George is definitely a contender for the top 100 in-state kid. Um, along the defensive line. So you got to watch out for the Bulldogs with you know just about everybody, especially the in-state guys. But Gregory Xavier Thomas, seen him a couple times live, really, really like him. Um, Florida State's probably the one to get that one done. I feel good about that. My crystal ball is on the Seminoles over LSU and Miami. And then last, Octavian Wallace, another one that I absolutely think, or, or, sorry, Florida State gets that one done. And uh, over Georgia, South Carolina, Arkansas, um, he's, you know, according to Zach Glostein, who does a phenomenal job over at Knowles 24 7. Wallace has claimed Florida State as his leader multiple times publicly. Um, so we'll see if that stands true and if they can get it done. Man, love that kid. 10 8 4 uh, in the 100 meter, but, you know, he reflects it on tape. Love the way he plays speed and space. Brother, getting ready to go, probably day three of the NFL draft, was a guy that was highly ranked for us. Uh, played his ball at Kentucky, Trevin Wallace there. Uh, Drew, you might have touched on it a little bit. I like this Zaire Addison kid. You know, I just talked about it, right? I, like, I'm, I'm I'm watching a lot of these guys for the first time. He's pretty interesting to me, though. Like, he, he he's a guy with a uh, pretty long wingspan, I think closer to, to seven feet. Um, one of those body types you got to build up, but he's only 6'4". It, do, where, where do you kind of see him from a position projection standpoint? So we, we originally listed him as a tackle or graded him out as a tackle, moved him to IOL, and then moved him back to tackle after I saw him at that Under Armour camp. I agree with you. I, I I think he might be athletic enough to play on the left side after some years of development. I mean, he's got a wrestling background. Uh, I, I'm a fan. I agree. And yeah, versatile up front. I think that's the name of the game, volume shoot. I'll say this about Florida State's class. What I also like about it, four commits right now. They're all from the Sunshine State. So you got Solomon Thomas. Uh, and Tramel Jones up in the Jacksonville area. That is a, a key city if we're talking about the recruiting landscape in, in Florida. Then they got uh, Javion Hilson from the Space Coast where they shoot the rockets up in the air at Cocoa High School, uh, and Ethan Pritchard, linebacker out of Sanford Seminole High School, which has turned into a, a bit of a FBS factory. Like I, I think it's notable that Mike Norvell and his staff are going into these different parts 
of, of the state and kind of planting a flag. They go down and if they're able to get Gregory Xavier Thomas out of Plantation American Heritage, where Pat Sertan used to be the head coach, that'd be another notable win. And then Zaire Addison, he's on the other side of the state. So, you know, FSU really prioritizing in-state talent. And I think that's been a focus for Mike Norvell here uh, ever since he arrived. As a little uh, PSA, I've just been informed. We have hit over 10,000 views. The new time slot. Let's go, baby. That's firing me up, guys. Like I said, if you got questions in the chat, make sure you're firing them on X. You can also do it on the 24-7 Sports YouTube channel. Make sure to like and subscribe. Also, if you're on the airwaves, leave a review for the boys. You know, we give out rankings all the time. That's your uh, place to do it. I don't know if that's a good thing that I'm encouraging you to do that. But uh, you get the point. All right, the last team here. That we got to keep an eye out. And honestly, one of my favorite teams, I think, to watch over the last two years recruiting-wise, how about Tennessee? They're just there at number 12 right now. You think about their past three finishes, 13, 10, 17. I think one of the biggest surprises that nobody really talks about is, like, Tennessee is a very legit recruiting operation under Josh Heupel. And I, I, don't, I don't think that a lot of people really expected that. Not to say that it would be deficient or that it wouldn't be adequate, um, but they're above average. They're above, above average. They're good. That's where I would put Tennessee as a recruiting program. And, Drew, you think about what they could get done here. You got guys like Jamie French, one of the best receivers in the country, still on the board with Darius Jackson, household name in the 24-7 sports <laughs> scouting group text over the last week. David Sanders Jr., number one tackle in the country. Laganza Hayward, Andrew Ivins, big fan of him. And then Marion Dye out of Indiana, the number 37 edge in the country. So, Drew – Tennessee, man, these names out of all the three programs that we went through and we talked about the possible finishes, this one got me the most excited. Well, they got their quarterback, right, George McIntyre. I I think the story with Tennessee over the past two cycles has been building the depth on the defensive side of the ball. Now you look at some of those names you just mentioned, Laganza Hayward, I mean, he's a dude. I, I, what is he? Is he a safety you know, is he a hybrid, maybe some type of backer? I don't know. I want that guy on my team. Uh, you know, excited to see him on there. Uh, I'm going to ask Tom. I mean, you read off David Sanders. What's the latest on Sanders? Nothing's changed for me, man. I still feel really good about Clemson. Um, had a conversation with uh, an <laughs> offensive line coach in college football this week that made it pretty clear they feel Clemson leads. But I'm going to hold off on my crystal ball pick. I know he's got Alabama, Georgia, Ohio State, a couple others still very much involved. But I just – I don't see it. I don't see anybody beating Clemson at this point for him. So that would be – if Tennessee can get that one done, it would be huge. But I, I, I think the Tigers get that one done. At what point do you put in a crystal ball? I feel like your crystal ball insecurities are playing out live. I mean, earlier That's, in the show you were I'm talking – a lot of crystal ball picks. That's what I've been known for for right. the last couple of years. <laughs> It's ridiculous, the, the hate. The percentage is pretty strong, though. Like, if you really dig deep, um, and I don't change a lot last second, I feel like I got a pretty strong hit rate. But um, I just want to be patient. David Sanders, he's allowed to be patient with his process. I'm allowed to be patient with my process, all right? So just take it easy, all right? Cooper, all right. Yeah. Cook, cook on Radarius Jackson, since you're so such a big fan of him. Yeah, I need to hear the backstory on this. Go yeah, ahead. Yeah, let me – no, let me cook. I mean um, – you know, we had our audit here of Alabama, Mississippi, Tennessee. I still have Kentucky to do this week. And what I mean by that is, you know, a lot of time is spent on the top 247. And then when the time allows, obviously, we get to our regional recruiting and our scouting as well. So a lot of time to kind of catch up on the tape. Radarius Jackson was a guy that we had ranked as a high three-star, uh, 89 uh, overall rating. You go look at him, uh, just a lot of bounce. You know, I love the profile, 6'2 plus. Uh, around 180 pounds, basketball, track and field. I believe he's going to participate um, in this spring. So I'm excited to see that, um, you know, and also the collegiate feedback on him is super positive and obviously that helps. But everything you watch on tape, just the way that he plays, it's kind of Courtney Crutchfield-ish. I wouldn't go that far. Um, but if there's a player uh, that kind of reminds me that had two-way snaps that you feel really good about that you really don't know, is he going to be a receiver? Is he going to be a defensive back? You get curious in a good way, like, hey, this guy could blossom into one of many different things. Um, so just on the audit, you know, came over him, like him a lot. Uh, I think he's a really good dynamic player. I think what we are waiting for right now is the context to kind of catch up to the tape. And I think we'll have that here in a couple months. 
just to add on that, Ryan Callahan, who does a great job over at uh, Go Vols 24-7, um, he made it very clear despite, and again, I don't, I don't, it's not a dig at you guys, but despite his three-star rating, no, uh, Tennessee is just very, very high on this kid and top of the board. Like, obviously, everybody's going to be talking about Jamie French, but they love this kid. And, and that was a, a good early evaluation by them. And I think that that recruiting effort that they're putting forward and, and treating him like a like a five star, treating him like a top of the board, I think that's what gives the volunteers the edge over Ole Miss, Auburn, Oregon, and a couple others. So in the end, I, I really do think that Tennessee gets that one done. Um, despite you know, if you go back to the other receiver, Jamie French, I don't see Tennessee winning that one. But again, coming off a great visit to Knoxville, he's just there this week. So you know, keeping on the balls, but but my crystal ball for French, you know, remains on Ohio State. Drew, Tennessee's receiving core kind of has a, uh, I don't want to say Washington feel to it, but I feel like one day we're just going to look up and people are going to say, who are these guys? Where did they come from? And I'm talking <laughs> about guys like Nathan Leacock and Braylon Staley. When you think about those type of guys, and then you think about a guy Mike like Matthews. Redarius Jackson, Mike Matthews as well, right? The highest ranked guy out of all of them. Um, and Nico's going to be the guy to make those guys go. I think that's what that really fires me up. You think about what Tennessee has on the perimeter. I mean, dude, I, I'm I'm excited to see Tennessee Rocky Top. I think we're going to see – it's not going to be too far off from what we saw two years ago with Hendon Hooker, right? I, I think that offense is getting ready to click. I'm super excited, and I think quite honestly – I mean, dude, I, they had some guys, Jalen Hyatt, Cedric Tillman. These guys that they got coming up, they might be young, but they're dynamic. Ethan Davis at tight end. And I, I wrote this down because I wanted to get it in what, talking Tennessee. I like the running back commit, Justin Baker, out of Buford High School. He reminds me a little bit of Jalen Wright, who is preparing to go in the NFL draft. Sounds like he could go day two now. Put on the tape of those two side by side. I think there's some similarities now. He's only ran for you know 700 yards the past two years. But I like that when you think about the big picture of this recruiting class. I, I think he fits the offense. All right, guys, like I always say, Tuesday and Wednesday, that's for the Oyster Boys. That's when you reserve on your calendar a little college football recruiting talk. What about Thursday? 24-7 Sports Live, Thursday, 5 o'clock Eastern time on the 24-7 Sports YouTube channel. Smoke Dixon, Carl Reed, Emily Proud, breaking it down. It's kind of a little bit uh, a musical chairs with that crew. You don't know who's going to be on that show every Thursday, but a great product. Nonetheless, make sure to check that out. And without further ado, boys, we got there in less than an hour but we got viewer questions. So this is the time where we see our kind of numbers. It's a little bit of an uptick. People like to get in there, ask really good questions. Guys, the feedback has been phenomenal over the last week. So we encourage you to continue to do that. If you have questions, make sure to fire them in right now. But we got some questions off the top. Um, and this is one is from Brad Tejada. Brad, we appreciate you watching the show. Any teams to watch out for when the portal opens up to make big moves? All caps, big moves. Tom, Andrew, I'll give you a little time to maybe think about this. Um, I'd expect Alabama to be a player, right? I think that makes sense. I think the other team that kind of, uh, to me, um, that I would look out for, how about Michigan? I mean, they're losing a lot in the NFL draft, right? And you think about a team that very quietly had a lot of success in the transfer portal. I mean, Drake Nugent, Josiah Stewart, they did a really good job there. I'm interested to kind of see if uh, Sharon Moore, to use Andrew's analogy, takes the car out of the garage and kind of says, all right, what, what, what is available here via the transfer portal in the second, I don't want to call it secondary market, but the second transfer portal window. And I don't know, I, I, feel, I, I feel like contenders can kind of be picky. And I think I, those are the teams that I expect to kind of be the most aggressive. So my short list, Alabama, <laughs> like you said, Michigan, I would put them in there as well. Who is going to start at quarterback for Michigan? Is is that just wide open? I mean, could they go try try to find a veteran? I'd like them to. There goes Tom on the on the keyboard. No, I'm kind of blanking because somebody somebody said something to me the, the like like two weeks ago when I was in uh when I was in New Orleans and said that he was the favorite. I'm just blanking on who it was. Um, but go ahead. Sorry. Well, now you just broke the thought process, but that's okay. Um, Michigan, I don't, I don't think we have an answer yet at quarterback. I think, you know, I kind of thought that as well. Like, what happens if one of these guys, like, you know, uh, this? Uh, <laughs> it's funny. It's the first name that like jumps to my mind. But what happens with Ohio State's quarterback room? 
right? What happens if one of those guys jumps in, whether it's a, a Devin Brown or a Kineholz or an Aaron Nolan, you know, and I trust me, I know Michigan fans are, are very high on Jaden Davis and they should be. Um, but you wonder if there's an experienced arm out there that you might think if you're Sharon Moore, like, hey, let's bring in some some more competition here and maybe some guy with, uh, you know, a little bit more experience because it's not a room that's got a lot of run. J.J. McCarthy has been the guy there for the last three years. I think the other category would be you're a team that feels like you're a contender, right? So uh, let's take Miami, for example. You got Cam Ward in for your 15 spring practices. You realize that maybe, hey, you're a piece away. You know, maybe we need a wide receiver. Maybe we need – uh, a corner. Uh, I, I think teams like that, that, that view one singular piece, it could be the difference. So those are the one, you know, I, I don't know who that is. I think Miami you could put in that category. I mean, there's a, there's a bunch of schools. The name, the name that I was given was Alex Orgy from the, um, the sophomore quarterback out of Texas um, as probably the leader in the clubhouse. So kind they of like him. I mean, there's been, there's been, been some po- there's been some positive buzz uh, around Orgy a lot. So more as I would say the athlete, obviously, I mean, you got to see him in the CFP, a couple packages that they put in as a runner. So we'll see what happens. I think Michigan is definitely a team to watch. Never discount Miami. What right? about my, just with Mike Elko and everything? You think, I mean, that's a good one. I have to assume they're going to be involved with a lot of guys. I think any first year head coaches uh, you could look at and probably say, all right, these guys are going to take the the grocery cart out and kind of see what's available. So we'll see what happens there. All right. Another question, Corey Williams, where do y'all think Juju Lewis is most likely to flip? Um, Juju Lewis, Juju Lewis, excuse me, five-star quarterback, uh, Julian Lewis. Uh, Tom, why don't you lay it out for us, the options right now and the contenders for Julian Lewis, even though he's committed to USC. Yeah, I think you're watching Georgia, Auburn, Alabama, um, I'm sure a couple others are involved, but it's really that's kind of the big three, in my opinion, um, along with obviously USC, who's committed to. But I think it's going to be Georgia. I felt that way for a long time. I just I can't see Kirby Smart missing if he really wants him and he pushes hard for him and gets it done. Um, it just seems like it's, it's it makes the most sense. Keep him in state. Now, all the rumblings and the rumor and the chatter about him potentially transferring to modern day. Um, that went away. I, I thought that was going to help solidify him with USC. When that didn't happen, that kind of you know had sirens going off in my head that I thought Georgia was really making a, making a push there. So Alabama feels good, um, not great. I know they're working hard on Deuce Knight, Notre Dame's quarterback commit as well. Those are probably the two I'm watching for Bama. But in the end, I just I've heard too much for too long that I think Georgia gets it done. Drew, what do you think about that potential fit, Julian Lewis, in, in Georgia, if that would happen? Uh, <laughs> does he fit the scheme? Does he fit the offense? Like, I want to see him in a wide-open look. I want to see him in a, a Hugh Freeze attack. I want to see him in a Kalen DeBoer attack. I want to see him in a, a Lincoln Riley attack. Um, that That's kind of my raw – that was about as raw of a reaction you're going to get. That was very raw. The pause sold it as well. Um, well, I, hey, I, I just got two tickets to FAU's opener on, on Friday. Was, was well, that. Yeah. Did that happen? Why I asked you that question? Yes. Is that what played into it? Uh, right. Yes. It makes sense. Um, here's what I think. I, yeah, I think Julian Lewis ultimately ends up at Georgia. You look at that quarterback room, thanks to our friends at uh, Next Gen. You look at that quarterback room, Carson Beck off to the NFL, right? And then after that, what do you have? You got Gunnar Stockton, you got Ryan Puglisi, and then it kind of opens it up for Julian Lewis. And here is what I would be willing to bet. Even with those three, I don't think Kirby Smart would stay pat. I think he'd bring in a transfer. I mean, you almost saw him bring in a guy like Jaden Maeva this year as well. I think they go out and probably add another arm. And, you know, Kirby's earned the luxury of being able to do that. You know, best player is going to play at the end of the day. Drew, I, you know what I think back to? I, you've always been uh, staunch on Puglisi and post Carson Beck. I'm kind of excited how it plays out for him. Have you gotten any feedback yet on Puglisi through spring ball? I know it's only been one week, but I I have, I haven't on Julian Lewis, Tom, you know, Colorado, Indiana, keep getting mentioned with him. Is that, is that real or. I mean, I think he's got interest and I think he's, I think that's more of like a relationship factor, especially with Indiana, but no, I can't, I can't see that one happening in the end. Okay, so handicap it for me. So rank them. 
USC, Georgia, Auburn, Alabama. I mean, we're, we're Georgia. I would put at the top, and then probably Alabama. Let me um, rephrase. Okay. Who are the two that have the best chance of flipping him? I'm really tough. I'm really torn between Auburn and Alabama. That one, I think there's more smoke with with Auburn than people are letting on. And I think there's a lot of buzz around that program. But um, And I think with Alabama, from what I've gathered, they're treating Deuce Knight like he's really like the top number one guy. And they've made him such a priority for such a long time. And I think he's such a great fit. And he's got a great relationship with the staff. Goes back with DeBoer and uh, Sheridan. So, so I think I think it's Georgia, but I think I'm kind of leaning, starting starting to lean towards Auburn over Alabama, but I just don't I don't see it working out for USC. And I love the fit there. I think he'd be phenomenal, probably win a Heisman at USC, but I think he could do that elsewhere too. Question: <laughs> I don't know how we're here, but you know, I got my mind turning. Julian Lewis doesn't end up at USC. What direction do they go? I would go to I would go offer KJ Lacey. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming they have offered. I haven't looked at it, but that would be a guy that I went after. Um, that would be a priority. I would 100% go after Keelan Russell. Um, I know you guys are kind of high on him. Um, that would be, that would be an immediate push. I think those two right there. Cause I think KJ Lacey, I think there's some buzz there that he could be looking around. So. Cause here's the other thing. USC didn't take a 2024 quarterback. DJ Lagway was a major target for Lane yeah. Riley. Well, we'll see what happens with, um, with Oregon and Hussan Longstreet. I mean, I think Hussan Longstreet's kind of an interesting domino. And are you surprised at, at this point? It doesn't seem like USC is very involved with Longstreet, Drew. Yeah. I mean, is Oregon involved with Longstreet? I thought I thought it was. They are. They have Akili Smith in the boat, but I believe they're actively recruiting. Still recruiting Longstreet, yeah. Right. And so. USC's got a commitment, so why would they be? I, I think they still feel decent enough about keeping him, so I don't know why they would even do any due diligence of recruiting. Hussan? Husan in Auburn is the one I get excited about. Tom, you have to do your due diligence. If you're I'm not Oregon. saying it's – yeah, I agree with you. I'm just saying their best shot at this point is to just go all in with Juju and hope for the best. But I completely agree, but, you know, you yeah. got to have a you got to have another plan. So it would be fascinating to see what happens with, with Julian Lewis. That's especially. With that's, a, that's a lot of distance to overcome, you yeah. know, um, not to mention – you know, it, it's not the honeymoon period, but it's a lot easier to navigate these waters in the spring than what happens if USC has another down year, right? I think a lot of it is contingent on how these guys play and how they operate as well. If you're USC, okay. would you would you play any hardball with Juju and just be like, look, we got to be done with the visits. We got to be done with just give us a decision. Are you in or out? Would you do that or would you just risk it? I don't get I don't the impression of Julian Lewis that that's how he operates. You know, uh, and, and, uh, go ahead. They're Drew. not. They're not in position to do that. They, he's the only kid they have committed in 2025. And he's great. a reclass. Recla USC recla has one commit. Am I wrong on that? I don't know. I'm just just wondering. Uh, we can fact check that one. But yeah, he's he's their only commit, and he reclassed. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. <laughs> All right. Should we keep it going on the on the Q and A's, boys? Yeah. Um, there's a question from Lance Glenn, our former producer. I'm going to skip that one. Uh, Andrew Moorman says, I got a viewer question. If the Ducks have another high octane offensive season, do you see Will Stein, the offense coordinator, landing a head coaching job? And does that cost the Ducks any recruits like Dallas Wilson? Uh, I'll go first. Yes, I think Will Stein is maybe one year away um, at the quickest rate to a head coach. Like if they have another successful season, I think he'll be a hot name for sure. Uh, and I think it's more likely than not that he would land a job than that he wouldn't. That being said, it all depends on the scope of what Will Stein is looking for. If he's looking for a power four, very coveted job, um, maybe he's there another year. Uh, but if Oregon has a a year where they get into the college football playoff, I think it's very realistic that Will Stein uh, won't be there in 2025. In terms of Dallas Wilson, I don't know. I, I think ultimately at the end of the day, you feel pretty good about who your head coach is and and the way that he recruits. So I, I think they'd be be fine there in my opinion, but that's just me. I would agree with that in the sense of, I think the majority of the commits picked Oregon for Dan Lanning, for Oregon, for what they're building there. Um, Dallas Wilson's an example that I could absolutely see him ending up elsewhere. 
Um, if I was going to put a projection in, I'd probably say he would end somewhere, end up somewhere in state, in the state of Florida. He's from Tampa, probably Miami at this point. But um, you know, and I think that would be a, an out for Adrian Wilson. I think that he would potentially leave. Oregon, he's got some great opportunities, but again, those guys, Matthew Johnson, a bunch of those guys, they've all spoken highly of Dan Lanning and the future that they're building there in, in Eugene um, and all the other guys that haven't committed yet are just raving about him and him alone. So I think the right guys are, are you know, choosing Oregon for the right reasons. I would, you know how you can list commits as like soft verbals? Like I, I would put that for Dallas Wilson if I was in charge of his profile, oh. um, you know, you know great player i just he's he's made it seem like the commitment is is very soft ever since he committed to oregon uh i you know i agree with what cooper said you know it, does will stein want p4 would he look at a g5 job got uh, ties to the state of texas you know baylor could potentially open up um that could cause a domino effect with some of those other programs like texas state U, utsa so uh, but I, even if he leaves, you know, the, the, the conductor there is, is Dan Lanning. And as long as Dan Lanning's running the ship, I, I wouldn't be concerned about what they're bringing in on the offensive side of the ball, even though he's a defensive coach. All right, Lance Glenn, you earned it. Uh, those of you not familiar with Lance Glenn, he left us to go work in the stock market. Uh, he's a big guy now. He's doing big things there in New York and a uh, huge Rutgers fan. Almost to his demise. We talked about Rutgers way too much on this podcast, but we're going to talk about Rutgers right now. Lance Glenn, what do you guys think of top 247 athlete and Rutgers commit to Libby Kaba? What position can he make the biggest impact at the next level? Drew, all you have not seen this kid yet. <laughs> this is a steal, Lance. Um, <laughs> Gabe Brooks, Hudson Standish, they told me I had to watch this kid. He is young for his grade at Hillside High School. Two-way player, running back, linebacker. I think he is a linebacker all the way. He can roll. Um, just that mid-skill athlete you're looking for. I kind of looked up and I'm like, wow, he's he's headed to Rutgers to play for Greg Schiano. A excellent evaluation and, and getting him committed. And, and again, the big thing is he is young for the grade. I think he could technically be a class of 2026 prospect. So um, that is the gym early on of Rutgers recruiting class. There you go. How about that? A little bit of Rutgers. Greg Schiano, man, doing a good job over there. So I'm excited to kind of see where they are. What are we, year three or year four of Schiano back at Rutgers approaching? Come on, boys. I need a sharper than this. I know we're hour 13 in, but uh, that will be worth a Google. All right, one of the last ones here. Um, kind of touched on it earlier in the show. Jason Hines, two for two, Jason Hines. Uh, you had a question yesterday. Hey, fellas, is this something? I'm, I'm assuming something means Caden Proctor we should expect as normal in the future could Caleb Downs return. Um, I do not want to speculate on Caleb Downs. I will say in all honesty, yes, there has been some rumblings about Caleb Downs and his future. That being said, it is all speculative. Nothing of it that uh, quite honestly, at least in my own opinion, is of any substance. Um, but there has been some scuttlebutt about potentially Caleb Downs uh, looking around. Uh, that being said, I have not been able to substantiate any of that. Um, Tom, I don't think you have either. I texted um, somebody after we started on this because I was trying to get an idea, and it was essentially without giving much more context. They kind of laughed at it. So I think that Ohio State fans can feel pretty good about keeping Caleb Downs in the boat. And Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Uh, in terms of is this something that we should expect as normal? Normal, I wouldn't say, um, but I don't expect this to be the only case. I think we can see this a little bit more going forward. I don't, I don't expect it to be a everyday thing, but I also don't expect it to happen once a calendar year. I, my thought on it, I think as if, if there aren't changes, yes, we're going to see more of this. We're going to see a lot more of it. We live in an era where players seem to follow what other players are doing. So now that people know that this is something you can do, it could certainly become a trend. Like I touched on in the beginning of the show, I hope this is the one that sounds the alarms and brings some type of change. I don't know who creates the change, but yes, until there are some 
guardrails, you know, rules put in place, we're, we're going to see more of this. All right, last question, boys, I think. And who else? It's our boy, Michael, Dallas fan, Campbell. <laughs> Dude, you bring it every day. I love it, brother. How do you see wide receiver Javon Boggs flipping from Ohio State to Notre Dame with the commitment of quarterback Brady Hart before the summer? A visit may be on the way. Well, uh, Michael, there's nobody better. Uh, Andrew used to be on the beat in South Bend, Tom, obviously, as well. Um Tom, I, I guess I'll start with you on on Javon Boggs, and then Drew. I know you you have a pretty good grasp of the players, so we can go from there. I don't necessarily see him flipping to Notre Dame. He's currently committed to Ohio State, like you mentioned, but um, he's definitely going to do his due diligence, look at a couple schools. Um, he seems to really like Ohio State, and I and I don't think Ohio State is interested in pushing him out, you know, by any stretch. So. I think that there's a good relationship there. I think Ohio State's doing a great job with some other guys, Jamie French, Rennell Brown the third. So they're going to fill up, and, and it's going to be up to Boggs if he wants to stick it out or not. But Notre Dame's definitely got a shot. Mike Brown, the wide receivers coach, doing a good job there. Mike Denbrock as well. So that's an opportunity. And then before we go on to quarterback, obviously, if you want to touch on touch on Boggs as a player, Ivan's go for it. I mean, I, something that Notre Dame really doesn't have at receiver. I mean, he's a unique body type, you know, a thicker side. I think he's gone four or five on the lasers, put up a monster senior or excuse me, junior season at Coco, which won a two S state title in Florida. Lot of shorter routes, run after catch type of guy. I mean, he made a name for himself against Florida State corner signee uh, Charles Lester. He had, he had a monster game there. Um, cool. For Notre Dame, I think that's what they need more of in that wide receiver room guy that can work the slot kind of reminds me a little bit of Ricky Pearsall who's another one that is shooting up NFL draft boards what he did at Florida um my thought would be I mean Ohio State seems to be in it for some premier pass catchers they got guys commit it feels like Bryson Rogers a few cycles ago you know he was the number four in the receivers class you know where is Bryson Rogers he entered the portal and he returned he came back yeah yeah he was a, a. We went back and forth on that one, huh? Trying to figure out where he would kind of stack at the end of the day. Um, that's a intriguing room. There's a couple other guys that I'm just kind of waiting to see what happens. Keon Graves, a guy out of Arizona that I liked a lot. Obviously, I think just kind of waiting his turn, trying to figure it out. I got to give props to Ohio State. Uh, they seem to do a good job being able to keep their guys in the boat. Super talented ones too. Um, they're obviously not prone uh, to guys like Noah Rogers hitting the portal, but. I mean, you think about their ability to retain some top-tier talent and some guys that haven't seen the field in quite some time, especially in the receiver room. I think that's that's just a nod to to Brian Hartline and the job that he's done. And then, Tom is is Brady Hart the, the guy for Notre Dame here in the twenty twenty five or twenty six cycle? It's possible. I know Steve Wolfong threw in a crystal ball pick for Notre Dame. I'm just not I'm not there yet. Um, I know Noah Grubbs in Florida. You can call it your backyard. Uh, I know he's visiting Notre Dame, and he actually will visit first. And when I talk to Noah, he seems more inclined to make an earlier decision than Brady Hart. Brady Hart seems like a guy that, yeah, he could go and visit and pick Notre Dame and and great, but he just doesn't seem like he's in a rush. He seems kind of still early in his process, loves Notre Dame. So do I think they're the leader or top three? No question. But I think Notre Dame's in the top three for Noah Grubbs. And then you got other guys like Ryder Lyons. He's he's high in Notre Dame. He's going to visit. Troy Hoon, he's going to visit. Um I don't think they really have a shot at Jared Curtis. So I do think that the quarterback in the class will probably be Noah Grubbs or Brady Hart. But the reason I haven't put the pick in is because there's still a shot that Grubbs gets to South Bend, realizes that 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 spot could be gone sooner rather than later. And he beats Brady Hart to the punch. I know they both have the green light. So we'll see what happens. 14,000 live viewers. Guys, congratulations, everybody following along with the Oyster Boys today. Tom, must be the lucky charm, man, coming on the show. Every time you come on, we break a record. So, guys, we appreciate it. As always, if you're following on X, make sure to like, retweet. Also, if you're following on the 24-7 Sports YouTube channel, it is very much appreciated if you like and subscribe. Also, leave a comment on there as well, guys. As always, we appreciate you following along with us. For Andrew Ivins, Tom Loy, I'm Cooper Patagna. Have a great rest of your week, and we'll see you next Tuesday.